This clash was centered around two separate events scheduled in the city's northeast quadrant. The scheduled events were peaceful in nature and all attendees are not to be blamed for the violence that transpired alongside them. I wanna be very clear, the clash was not a protest. This was a planned targeted attack made by some members of the involved communities. This is really the largest violent event to happen in our city in recent memory, if you think about the numbers of people that were involved in this. We are actively investigating this incident and we will hold those responsible for the criminal activity that took place there. It, it could be characterized as a riot, but at the end of the day, I, I think it's fine just to say that it was a, a senseless violence that was sort of planned and premeditated. I think the underlying issues that, that sort of, you know, drive this are, are very complicated. Um, and there's very strong feelings on both sides of it, as you might expect. But at the end of the day, we're not policing ideologies. We don't, we're not, we don't get on one side or the other of this. This is around behavior for us. And so the behavior that we see in the videos and in the, in the reporting of this is the very same behavior that we've seen in other cities. And it's, it's not okay. And it's not okay in our city. Um, I would have been very happy to see arrests made at the scene. I think there's a real deterrent effect to that, but I understand and support the decisions that were made around uh, the priorities that were set and executed. And so that's fair enough. We'll deal with it after the fact. No, I don't think you'll see it that quickly. We put together a task group today, an investigative group that will go after all of the offenses in relation to this. So again, I think it's really important that, uh, that we demonstrate that this is not okay in our city and that the individuals who committed criminal offenses there in the parking lot be held to account for that. Well, I think with respect to the violence, like when we're talking about bringing, you know, rocks and bricks and that type of thing and throwing them at other people and putting them in the hospital, I think there should be some serious repercussions for that. This is not something we can condone in our uh, city and the people that were involved in, in the worst of that uh, should, should feel the wrath. You know, dealing with violence after the fact, Act, right the he says there that we'll deal with it after the fact uh that just just doesn't make any sense to me what about you said well i can understand in the sense you know perhaps they weren't expecting this to be a 150 person brawl uh, and to bring enforcement into a crowd like that could have some serious complications for police that are involved um so i can understand them maybe wanting to take a step back from the situation to assess observe and of course uh, go after them later on However, if you're not going to be taking action in the moment in situations like this, where, as he says, you know, it could be characterized as a riot, um, yet, in the other hand, what did we see? Again, during the Freedom Convoy and the Freedom Protest, pardon me, demonstrations, uh, we saw the heavy hand of enforcement when perhaps it was less needed, especially less needed than situations like this. Uh, we saw arrests. We saw, uh, like, for instance, uh, the fist bump that one of the officers uh, engaged in, I guess you could say, uh, with one of the demonstrators over the weekend at this riot. Uh, you had officers getting punished for shaking hands of freedom demonstrators. And yet here, this guy with the fist bump, is that officer going to get reprimanded or punished in any way? Um, so I think, you know, even though he does say he wants to, you know, take a step back and doesn't want to police ideologies, their actions are in a sense still telling. It's so ironic that they don't want to police ideologies. And yet the police really do that when they uphold drag queen story hours at public libraries and prevent anyone who's protesting that ideology from doing so. Um, they arrest the the one side heavy handedly while the other side goes forward, you know, pretty much unabated. Um, it's funny because, well, we have we have a clip here that maybe we'll throw to as well. Um, where police officers plot to arrest a peaceful demonstrator uh, against Calgary's radical new anti-protesting bylaw. And just, I, again, I, I said it during the live stream yesterday, and I'll say it again, it highlights really the hypocrisy of the bureaucracy. Um, there's It's Pastor Derek Reimer. We saw Archer Pawlowski. I mean, the amount of political dissidents that were treated harshly cannot be forgotten and cannot go unnoticed. Let's hear, maybe we can just play this, this quick clip. So at least if we can get some bid with her on the property, if she takes off, then at least we can deal with it if we don't have anybody to grab her. 
make sure that nobody can go snap her up later. Yeah. 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 Just walk it to the end there in the black jacket. Just walk straight down here, go up here. Yeah, so they're plotting there to arrest just a, a peaceful demonstrator who is there to simply have their voice be heard and be seen. Um, and, and then, you know, you can contrast that with the police chief saying, oh, well, we'll deal with these violent rioters after the fact. This it's just it's an unfair and unjust application of the law. And I think that more and more people are recognizing and realizing just how often this takes place. And that's not um, it's 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 largely due to the fact that we have independent media and independent journalists on the ground capturing these clips, capturing this footage, capturing these events where the mainstream media ignores or is silent or even maybe in some instances complicit in. And so it really highlights the importance of independent media like Rebel News, like on the ground, boots on the ground journalists, because without them, we would have no idea that these things are happening. And so you know, it's a great opportunity to support the kind of work you want to see continue in the field of journalism, because without this, I don't even want to think about where the state of affairs in Canada would be, at least when you can see and contrast these kind of events happening in real time, you can attempt to get some form of accountability. And I think that being aware that this is happening is obviously the first step in that. Um, and I think that the Calgary police are really seeing how much the public is in disagreement with the response, with the way that, that this was handled. And hopefully they'll uphold uh, their own their own opinion or their own saying there, not opinion, that uh, they don't police ideologies. That's That should be first and foremost. We need a clear separation between politics, ideologies, and the police. And we've seen that line really blurred and muddied over the last few years. And I think it's time to get that clear, definitive difference back and reestablished. Um, and so so that is where I'm kind of hopeful here, where the Cal Calgary police uh, have a chance and opportunity to correct this. But dealing with it after the fact is, I think, a bit of a slippery slope um, because you there's no guarantee. Yeah, there's no guarantee. And as well, we do bring up the... Uh, uh... Uh, some of the trans protesting and stuff that's happened around the libraries here in Calgary based around one of the uh, bylaws, I believe it were, uh, that Calgary Mayor Jody Gondek implemented, which basically made it illegal to protest uh, a, a trans or a drag time story reading hour type event. Uh, if you were within 150 meters of that location, you would be arrested. Uh, and we've seen that taking place in Calgary, and it's the police that are doing this. And you're supposed to have a right to peacefully protest, peacefully assemble. And if you're not engaging with people that are literally meters, 150 meters away with you, you're still not able to send that message. And yet here they are, the police, enforcing this, arresting people uh, because of these political bylaws or laws that are being put in place. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that to this, this restoration of law and order and um, as leader of the opposition party would call it, also the bringing common sense back home, right? That's something that I think resonates really strongly with Canadians now because they've seen the nonsensical hysteria. They've seen the knee-jerk reactions. They've seen the way that this uh, culmination of events has affected uh, their everyday lives. And I think as things become more uncomfortable in Canada, both financially and socio-politically, um, bringing common sense back home really resonates with people and so just kind of leading into our next video here, we have a quick clip of leader of the opposition, Pierre Polyev, calling out the Trudeau liberals for their nonsensical knee-jerk carbon tax and, and bail reform uh, for leading to chaos in the streets of Canadian towns across the country, which we saw over the weekend in Calgary. Sir, because after eight years of Justin Trudeau, Life costs more, work doesn't pay, housing costs have doubled. We see crime, chaos, drugs and disorder in our streets. Jagmeet Singh and Justin Trudeau have a solution. They want a 61 cent a litre carbon tax that will make life even more expensive. 
They put $60 billion of new inflationary deficits that drive up interest rates and taxes. They've created tent cities in major towns and centers across every uh, municipality. One in five Canadians now skipping meals. 1.5 million going to food banks because the Trudeau tax has driven up grocery bills so high. We see homelessness on the rise, hopelessness everywhere. Uh, Middle-class people who've always had homes and jobs now living in parking lots in places like Penticton uh, and Kelowna and even uh, in all across uh, Ontario and uh, in every region of the country, really. In fact, uh, everything's broken after eight years of Trudeau. But the good news is life was not like this before Justin Trudeau. And it won't be like this after he's gone. We're going to b- replace this costly coalition with a common sense conservative government that stands squarely with the hardworking people, their paychecks, their homes, their communities, and their futures. Yeah, as I said, I think that really, that those sentiments really re- resonate with Canadians who are struggling. And they see that the policies instituted by the Justin Trudeau Liberal Party, and many of them are knee jerk, not well thought out, not um, they don't have the infrastructure in place to make it a successful policy. And we're starting to see the fallout of those failed endeavors. Uh, And so when people hear, let's bring common sense back home, they, you know, that gives people hope. And I think after the last three years, we really need to bring that home to Canadians. Canadians are are yearning for that hope that it seems to be being brought back home by Pierre Polyev. Not that I'm, you know, an an uncritical fan, but uh, what we have in place right now is clearly not working and needs immediate reform. Hey folks, that was a clip from the daily live stream. I co-host it Monday to Thursday from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The Alberta team takes over on Friday. Please tune in. And by the way, we want to hear your two cents worth. If you're able to make a minimal $5 donation, we will read your chat on the air live. Thank you. Justin Trudeau's new censorship law, Bill C-18, it's a shakedown and a desperate attempt to keep the mainstream media afloat. Many have already lost their ability to access our Facebook and Instagram pages. The blackout will soon affect every user in Canada. We've partnered with Private Internet Access, a VPN provider dedicated to safeguarding digital privacy. For just $2 a month, you can maintain your access to our content across all your devices at piavpn.com slash rebelnews.